Hello and welcome everyone to our annual AmiPAL panel celebrating the women composers of the 2021 Primetime Creative Arts Emmys. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our panelists and Emmy nominees. Let's start with Laura Karpman nominated in the Outstanding Composition for a Serious category for Lovecraft Country on HBO, which she co-scored with Raphael Sadiq. Furthermore, we have Kristen Anderson Lopez. Uh, she has two nominations. Congratulations. Outstanding main title theme music for WandaVision on Disney Plus and outstanding music and lyrics for the catchy Agatha All Along or Agatha All Along. Uh, also from WandaVision and both co-scored with her husband Robert Lopez. Catherine Bostig is nominated in the Outstanding Music Composition for a Documentary category for her score to the PBS uh, American Masters uh, film documentary, Amy Tan Unintended Memoirs, which premiered at Sundance earlier this year. And last but not least, the amazing Zoe Keating, nominated in the Outstanding Composition for a Limited Series Television Movie or Special category for the HBO film, Oslo which she co-scored with Jeff Russo. And your moderator today is the amazing president for the Alliance for Women Film Composers, composer Catherine Choi. And here's to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Thomas. And thank you so much to all of our Emmy nominees for being with us today. We're so excited to talk to you. And the first thing I would like like to hear from all of you is simply about how you went about creating the sonic palette for each of your projects, very different projects. And uh, Zoe, how about we start with you? Sure. Um, well, uh, in in uh, our case, the um, the directors had the director had already used um, some bits of my pre existing music in the temp score. Um, and so they liked the idea of cello since my music is very cello centric <laughs> and um but they wanted they also really wanted piano and so we ended up working with um jeff russo and i and um the director was really clear that he wanted like just cello and piano so that's where we started like the cello just being a very sort of human emotional voice and then the piano sort of promotion and we started there and of course, as things do, it got bigger and bigger and bigger, but um, that's how we started with our interpretation, so. <laughs> Laura? Hi. <clears throat> um, the Sonic Palette. Uh, well, Lovecraft is a, is a funny project uh, because there's so much going on in it and every episode is really its own movie in essence, so you have kind of the war movie is episode six, the haunted house, which is episode three. Um, but I think, you know, we started out with Misha Green, who's the showrunner saying that she wanted um, gothic R&B, which is a, a term that neither Raphael nor I had ever heard of. And um, I don't know that we accomplished it. Um, I think that there is one track that maybe kind of does that. Um, and so I think it was really, you know, following Misha's lead, um, for me, a lot of it kind of lived in the world of mid-century modernism, um, which is a place that I feel comfortable with compositionally. Um, it also is a place that seemed to suit the project being that it takes place in 1955. And so kind of that, that era of concert music and also of scoring felt like it was the right, the right place for this to land. And, and so it did. Awesome. How about you, Catherine? Well, I was, um, I was talked, I was spoken, I'm so sorry, I just came back from a meeting of another <laughs> project I'm working on, it was very emotional, and I'm still reeling from that. So in the world, me, yes. Yeah, it was very, you know, as, as musicians, we're very empathic people, we just right. are. It's a great gift, but at and not a but, and at times, you, 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 you become so absorbed with what that visceral quality is you're feeling that you've been imbibing with. So let me decompress from that. Here's the deal with the Amy Tan score. A lot of the story is um, central to her upbringing with her mother wanting her to be a classical pianist. Her mother was a pianist in the household. 
she really was not nurturing of Amy to be this writer, this icon that she now is. And a lot of the story of this documentary is about the journey of their relationship and actually how in the, the trauma and the turbulence of that relationship, it actually fueled a lot of Amy's writing and her books and also began to heal that relationship. But they asked specifically for piano to be the central texture of the score, which for me was just a gift because that's my first instrument. My mother was a classical pianist. She played jazz and things like that too. But I grew up in a household where my mother would just, she practiced for hours. Her, her pet, her gift to herself was this Steinway piano and she would just sit for hours and play Ravel and Debussy and George Walker, William Grant Steele, Duke Ellington, and I was just a sponge. And then my brother would come home with McCoy Tyner and Bill Evans. And so, so for me, the score was a gift and the primary texture is piano with some percussion and then uh, some strings, string quartet. So Fantastic. that's it. All right, and finally you, Kristen. Well, talk about a, a tonal shift um, from yeah. Catherine. You know, I wish my mother was playing that kind of music. Um, I was watching a lot of TV in the 80s and sitcoms and reruns. Um, so when they came to us with this job, all of those hours that my mother had said, get outside, these hours in front of the TV are wasted. Actually, all those hours um, led to, oh, I just spilled my drink. Um, all those hours led to just TV music from I Love Lucy and My Three Sons On lives in my soul and in my body. Um, and, and so it was such a joy to get to basically take a sick day during my childhood, which started with I Love Lucy and you'd go through the decades, you know, by 11 o'clock, you're in the 60s with that girl. By three o'clock, you're in Partridge Family and Brady Bunch. By um, six o'clock, you're heading into um, 80s prime time. And um, honestly, the hardest one for us to crack was the 90s because that's when I was in college and didn't have a TV. Um, <laughs> but everything else lived in my body. Um, and then at the nothing core, good we... happened in the '90s, so you're okay there. <laughs> no, come on. Um, oh, um, we actually, you know, went to the original Riot Girl um, to get the vocals there, so that was a, a huge, wonderful honor. Um, but uh, at the core of it, my husband and I knew that it was about grief, um, mm -hmm. and that it needed to all be unified. It was a someone dealing with grief and dealing with it through stylizing it through the decades of TV she had in, invested. And so at the heart of it is this motif, WandaVision. Oh. Um, every single song, I, you know, from the, the first one, it's just WandaVision. And by the next one, next one it's WandaVision, what WandaVision. And by the, even Agatha All Along, which I loved that our host um, called it Agatha All Along. That was, that was the coolest. Uh, but <laughs> Agatha all along, um, the whole accompaniment is dun, 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 yeah. dun, 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 yeah. dun. Um, and it had the devil's interval in it, the tritone, um, which was sort of unsettling. Um, you know, it was, it was an unforgivable uh, interval in early, early music. And that is WandaVision. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and starting with you, and it, I mean, it, it must have been so much, so much fun for you and Robert to have the opportunity to take your idea and, you know, move it so many different ways. So that was, I mean, and that was really cool for us to experience as the audience, but can you, and then I'm going to throw this back to, to you, Laura and, and Zoe, can you talk a bit about the collaborative writing experience? Because all three of you wrote with someone else on this project. And, and this is something I think we're seeing more and more of. I personally feel like it's a really positive thing that's happening in the industry. We're seeing more people writing together as opposed to solo projects. Um, um, and could you speak a bit to the, I mean, obviously Rob is your husband, so there's that element too, but how is it collaborating with another creative on these projects? I don't really know anything else. I started, um, I started as a, as a lyricist in the BMI workshop and the first year of that workshop, you are, it's like speed dating for musical theater collaborators. So you, you know, I've had the great pleasure of 
working with probably over a hundred different people. Um, and I love it just like food. You don't want to eat peanut butter and jelly every single day. Like it, different people bring in completely different energies. And, um, you know, of course with my husband, um, we, we have evolved over the years. I think when we first began, we were a little competitive. Um, and he, he was, kind of ahead of me in like professionally he he knew what he wanted to do and be at age 13 and I kind of got a narrative that I should be an actress until until it was very clear like no there's another way for me to channel this love of theater um and but for a second it was competitive and I used to have to work really hard to be heard in the room um and then um <laughs> you know, just like marriage, we sort of um, figured it out, <laughs> figured out how to stop fighting before we started every song, how to listen to each other. Um, and, you know, we've even, we use this thing called conscious dialogue, um, which is a couples therapy thing, but we use it mostly in our collaborative work where if you just sense like somebody, there's energy in the room that's not open. We both have to do it and let one person gets to speak first and says, I am telling myself the story of blah, blah, blah. And the other person has to reflect it back before they're able to, um, to chime in with their own opinions. And you know that's, that's been great. So this is all to say collaboration is wonderful, but like any relationship, you have to work at it. Yeah, absolutely. Laura, you've been collabing with Raphael for a while. How, how is that working relationship? You know, it's funny. Um, I never, ever thought I would collaborate with anybody. Um, and then this, you know, it was like 20 years ago, but way before I started working with Raphael, I worked for a video game company and they said, you know, how do you feel about taking this theme? And I just thought, what do I want to deal with somebody else's theme? You know, well, I need that like a hole in the head, but it was kind of fun. And it turned a different direction and and Raphael comes from such a different musical world than I do um that it's that I find it exciting um I mean it's it it challenges me and the way that he makes music and the way he thinks about music is so different from the way that I think about music like so for him and I, I'm actually trying to find this more in my in the way, and it, it's fun. It's so funny you said this because I just did this today without really realizing it. But like Raphael gets, he'll pick up an instrument, and that instrument will speak to him. So like I will pick up all kinds of things just to have it here for when he comes over. Because if it's something new, he'll do different things with it. You know what I mean? It's like a, it's like dancing with a new partner. And I have started to to like even in my own writing stuff by myself try to instead of be theoretical about my composition get into whatever an instrument is speaking to me at that time so i've been working with like all these piano layers lately and stuff it's been cool but i like working with ray it challenges me um in different kinds of ways and you know like listen kristen was so disclosing it's not easy yeah it never is and i work with my wife too all the time and that is um a pleasure because she's right there. No, uh, it's always great, uh, but it, it it definitely it definitely challenges you. And there's there is a you know it there's a push and pull to it that without question that there isn't when you're working on your own. But that push and pull can also be really creative creatively stimulating. Yeah, and I love that you like understand how he works. So now you enable him by bringing new instruments into your studio for him to interact with it's like you're well, setting I mean, your partner up for success yeah i figured it out but one of the really annoying things is that you know i think a lot of people who are not music readers but are fabulous musicians wind up doing things in all flat keys so suddenly it'll be like g flat major or d it's like what you're killing me with these keys why are you doing this to me you know because it's like you know but for him it's very very natural the way he makes music is really really beautiful he's an he's a, an, a phenomenal musician um and so it, it's fun it pushes me it's like i don't know it's it's different and i love it i i, I and sometimes i'll say oh my god this is such you know it's so difficult like you were saying Kristen, but I think in the end it's worth it. Yeah, absolutely. How about for you, Zoe? Well, um, 
This was the third project that Jeff and I have worked on. We did uh, two TV series like five years ago. And um, uh, I'm sort of like, both of us are really used to collaborating with others because we come from, even though I'm a classical cellist, I come from a rock band environment. <laughs> you know, like I play the cello with Imogen Heap or Amanda Palmer or, and I'm used to kind of like, um, you know, going in there and improvising and sort of just throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks and, and not being too precious about things. And um, one thing I, I mean, I love, I love a lot of things about working with Jeff and we're really different <laughs> at the same time and how we approach problems is different. And you know, like, in addition to getting like totally emotionally invested in your project, um, you're like problem solving against a deadline. And it's so great to have someone else to because Jeff is going to problem solve differently than I am and there's always going to be a times when like maybe you've written a first pass and it didn't you know totally work out for the, the team or whatever and you have to go back and do it again and that's the time when we switch <laughs> yeah. you know like you work on this you work on this and um I especially with Oslo I was I think we were really lucky that we had some time before we had to dive into it like we had this kind of you know the, the production was held up by COVID and and so filming had to stop they were in Europe and um but it meant that Jeff and I had some time on our own to just think just to read the script mm. and to think about it and that is so sometimes you don't get that time sometimes you just have to dive right in you know and it was so great to have that time because we could just be here I'm, I'm in Vermont he's in LA and it's snowing and it's kind of like just thinking about the fragility of the plot and the characters and, the, and everything. And we both wrote something separately, sent it to each other, you know, sent it back. And that's how we write. It's like a game of exquisite corpse. You know, that, <laughs> that game where like somebody draws a head and folds over the paper and then leaves a neck and then passes it to the next person. And so um, we tend to send things back and forth and then we cut and paste from each other's to work like I'm like, I love this melody he did I'm going to drag it in I'm going to change the key or I'm going to change the meter and he'll take something from mine and he'll chop up my cello parts and send it back and be like can you do this and I just love that I, I love the, the I love that collaboration and I love how it makes it bigger than yourself and you come up with things you would never do on your own so yeah yeah amazing amazing <laughs> yeah. that's so cool well, Catherine, I want to throw it to you. And even though you were the sole composer on your project, uh, as we know, film scoring is always a collaboration with the filmmaker. And also, I wanted to ask you, you know, for, for the other three on the page here, we had, it was TV projects. So or, or, always had that, you know, opportunity for, for um, Emmy acclaim and, and that kind of path. But for you, when you start working on a documentary, you never know where it's going to end up. And you went through it. Sundance premiere and now you have this Emmy recognition. Could you talk a bit about your journey with Amy Tan on this documentary and the process of scoring it and and getting it to this point? It's a claim. Well, you know, I I look at each project as is is a gift of storytelling, you know, and you never know how things are going to end up. I mean, I I create music because that's what I love doing and I feel really fortunate that I'm able to to make a living doing what I love doing. Um, so this particular film, um, Jamie Redford uh, approached me, uh, I guess a few months before, before it was in post. And um, I had worked with him on a previous film that he had done, the, the film called Playing for Keeps. So we had a really great rapport and synergy and the whole team that he that he was able to sort of call forth, if you will, the producers, the editor, we all show up with reverence. We all have a sense of reverence for the story and for the intention of what he wants to, wants to do. I'm talking about him in present tense, even though he passed away just as I was starting. So part of my fuel was the grief that mm -hmm. I was feeling, that we were all feeling. And the grief um, made the reverence even more, uh, more prominent. So, um, you know, I just, I always just think about one foot in front of the other. You do the best you can. You, you, you show up being of service to the film. And in this instance, the editor was, was sort of left to, to helm the ship. He was left to really be the go-to person for all the, the feedback and, and, and the notes. And, and fortunately, he was also, he's also a musician, Jeff Boyette. He's fantastic. 
and he had temped the film. We didn't have much time, I had three weeks to, to do the score. And, and be, because there was such a fluidity and how we all came together, not only in the grief, but in the, the, the incredible multi-dimensional aspect of Amy Tan's story of her journey. We just all, it was all like a hand in glove, you know, and when you get to that place, you don't, you don't think about constraints. You don't think about deadline. You don't think about, am I gonna get an Emmy? You don't, you're just showing up and you're very much involved in this incredible energy field of, of collaboration. And we all had, we continue to have great respect for each other. And Amy Tan, her candor about her childhood and how traumatic it was and how it at the same time served her individually and, and, and served her as a writer. That, you know, it, it just, it all adds up to a formula that's organic and, and the most important word is genuine. And I think that when you show up with your authenticity in your, in your creative process, and for me, just in general, just show up, just, you know, really sit inside the depth of who you are as a, as a, as a human being and, and as a creator, you're gonna, you're gonna come up with something rewarding and it doesn't, it's not something that I overthink. It's not something that I'm having in my head as a strategy. I'm just loving this gathering of creators and of the intention of telling the story. So, so that's why, even though I had three weeks and it was easy for me, you know, piano is my instrument along with voice. And so I literally just sat down and played to picture. I just, I mean, Jeff had tempt very good and strong guidepost but right. there was that trust and that faith so that's how we got it done awesome three weeks that's incredible um and this kind of speaks to uh emily ippolito's question um for all of you how long did you have to work on these things we hear about the crazy timeline of tv so i would love to hear from from laura and zoe like you know you were working on an episodic situation and uh, Kristen, you were too, and I'll come back to you because your situation is somewhat unique, but for, for, for Zoe and, and then Laura, how much time did you guys have to turn around these episodes once, once you know, the schedule kind of got into its swing? Zoe first. Um, oh, sure. Um, well, you know, Oslo was a movie, so um, oh, that's right. first, first, we, first we, got the, we got the script, but um, we didn't have any footage for quite some time um, while they, you know, filmed over in um, uh, in Prague and Dubrovnik. Um, and then when we got the lock picture, we had six weeks to a full delivery, you know, finished, oh, wow. recorded. So that's, you know, everything composing, you know, and, and we had done, tried to do, tried to be prepared for that moment, but you never really, you, you need the final version of the film, like stuff had to be reworked. And so, yeah, we had, we had six weeks really from lock picture until you know the air date was like that the air date was really soon after delivery so yeah incredible six weeks mm -hmm. about laura how about for you with the episodic situation well you know lovecraft was a bear it was 10 episodes of wall-to-wall -wall orchestral music during a pandemic um so well <laughs> seriously and there was a little opera in there too at, at one point um we uh, you know first we had to in, um invent an orchestra which we did um and then we had to train that orchestra to record remotely because we were first out of the pack with all of this stuff uh, which we did um and then at a certain point i decided that my family and i should move to canada so <laughs> So, um, and, and just like we had this new puppy and, and I keep saying, whose idea was this? It was my idea. Who, and I, and whose idea was it to move to Canada? It was my idea. So that we did that too. Um, it was, we started working on it in March and, the, and then we finished the last episode in August. Um, but it was, it was an absolutely massive, massive undertaking. Um, and 
you know, so much of it because it was recorded remotely. Um, and it's, a, I think it's very similar. I mean, I know Chris and you guys recorded in, in Vienna. Um, I, it's, it's, it's a very similar process where before you send a score off to people, if you're not going to be there producing it, the score has got to be perfect. It's got to have everything that you want to say about the music in the score, because there's no other opportunity uh, to address it. Once it's recorded, it's recorded, and then you just fix what you fix. But it, Lovecraft was a very, very intense experience. Um, uh, you know, we were doing other projects, of course, simultaneously, but it was it was definitely the main the main dish for quite a while there. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you all for the Canada projects, uh, for the Canada comments. I loved it up there. <laughs> But we're back in LA because I really decided that I cannot do cold winters anymore. I'm very sorry. <laughs> That's so funny. Kristen, what what was your delivery schedule? You you have a different title sequence for each episode. Was that like all done kind of in one hit or was it? You, well, we, uh, it was about two years ago today that we got a call from Matt Shackman, the director, saying, I have this crazy thing. I can't talk to you about it. It really was like a CIA call. So I can't talk to you about it, but it's really fun. And I think you should do it, but you have to say yes before I can give you any of the material. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because Marvel is so- That's Marvel. Yep. <laughs> so careful about it. I mean, it really was like the firewalls had firewalls. Um, but he gave us just the very basic thing. And it was, it fell in this beautiful moment in our lives we just finished Frozen 2, which was a bear. And we had this window before we were gonna have to start um, a new movie and, and do the promotions and stuff for Frozen 2. So it was this fall moment of September and October. And we were like, we can write, we can write nine, you know, eight, 90 second songs in, in these weeks. Um, and then once we started writing, I think we, we got the girls going in school and then it really, there was one week where I think we hit the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, um, because they just burst out of me, like literally in the shower. <laughs> I would, I, I, once we would know what the hook was going to be, I would be dripping wet and run over to my notebook and scribble something, hand it to Bobby. He'd go to his piano and, you know, by noon, we'd have a, a a piano track and we'd be singing the demo by two and we'd send it to Marvel by four. It was so much fun. And it was so different than having to, you know, make likable characters and deal with the architecture of a whole giant story and making sure that the, that you've got a uh, eclectic enough score so that it covers the four quadrants. And this was not that this was, was like, have fun. I would do this for free at a party. So, um, so it really happened really fast. And I think we wrote the, Agatha all along was the last one to crack. And I think one of the issues was just knowing which decade, it, the original, the temp, the thing that was in the scripts said, that's so Agatha. But as I mentioned, the nineties, when that's so Raven was happening, I wasn't watching TV. I was hustling to try and, get somewhere in this business. And um, I didn't know that reference. So Bobby, we kind of went with that girl for a second, but it didn't seem right. And then one morning I woke up and I was like, I want to do like Munsters, Adam's Family, Willy Wonka and mash them all up um, in a, so that you've got that little goth kind of feeling. And then also Catherine Hahn's energy just is so, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, she's just so game and a, and yeah. wonderfully large with all of her choices. We wanted to give her something to bite into. Yeah, absolutely. I love that description of her. She's amazing. Um, we have a great question here from Hannah Scheib um, that I want to put to all of you, but I'm going to start with you, Catherine. And she says, any confidence is necessary in this type of work, but can be very hard if you're just starting out or facing lots of failures. What are some ways that you retain your inner confidence in composing mm. music, Catherine? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, especially, you know, when you are starting out and there's so much feedback that you're getting from a lot of different sources. I think, you know, it's like a muscle. You just have to, for me, I just try to, I take the notes, I take the direction and, and I just do the best I can. I mean, I, I'm, 
I work very instinctually. And you have to know that you're going to have to make modifications. You're going to have to maybe even throw things out completely and start all over. But you, you, you have to work with not letting it be a reflection on you as a composer, as a person. It is just, it's the object of what is needed at this time. And so again, this muscle of, of self-esteem, which is something we're unfortunately, we're not taught enough as far as I'm concerned, especially coming up as kids, you just, you know, we're, we're taught to have this approval with an external gaze, you know. So it's really important that you also just try to keep the joy of what you're doing, keep that buoyancy of this is fun, this is not a task per se, this is something that I'm crafting, I'm experiencing, I'm exploring, I'm experimenting. So you, you, you find ways to kind of talk yourself down from the tree and you yeah. talk to people, you know, you find if it gets really, really just gut wrenching, like, you know, your stomach is churning and you don't even want to share anything. You, you reach out to people who get you and who and they're not necessarily going to, you know, uh, pamper you, but they're going to give you constructive feedback. And you need that. You need those kind of people in your life in general. But it's a process. And the more, I mean, I've had countless situations where, I mean, one person told me I couldn't write. Another told me I couldn't sing. Another, you know, there's all these heavy duty naysayers. And at some point, I just got tired of, of really letting that drip into my soul. I was like, no, you're, you're totally not right. That's not correct. You have mm -hmm. to really know who you are. And yes, sometimes that means evaluating your strengths and your weaknesses. But if you fundamentally know you enjoy music, you're creative, and you're up for the journey of it, that's all you need to know. I'm telling you, the moment you yield to that more than the other stuff, that's when the bounty really happens. Just, you know, you make, you focus on yourself, not in an egotistical way, but just the unfolding of it. Does that make sense? I kind of went off on yeah, my Yeah, no, Stephen <laughs> Steven Zonheim wrote this beautiful song called Move On after he had he had, had the worst, like merrily we roll along, closed on Broadway after nine performances. The whole industry had been piling on. He started working with this new person, James Lapine, and and um, wrote Sunday in the Park with George about an artist. And, he, and in this, mm -hmm in this piece of work is this gorgeous song called Move On. And at the end of the piece, um, it says, anything you, knew, anything you do, let it come from you and it will be new. Mm. Give us more to see. And I've meditated on that, that song so many times. And I, just to sort of take my version of it that I sometimes have to say, remind myself. And, and it's such a simple thing and it's so hard to have faith in, but no one on this planet has ever been through the things that you as an individual have been through. You have your own dictionary that no one else in the whole world has. You have your own references of music, the birds that you grew up with, the song you heard last night, that moment that the ex-boyfriend dumped you and you felt the deep pain. They all live in you in this beautiful individual recipe that will never exist again. And all your job is as a writer is to show up at the blank page or at your keyboard and pour a little bit of that out. Just mm. let it pour out in however it wants to come. And if you just have faith in that and a practice that allows you to have faith in that, I also think it's really important if you go too long or you don't have a routine or a habit, it's too easy to put it off. There's too much good TV. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so ha having a practice where you just start pouring your, your truth, your words, your notes out. Um, it's, it was kind of mind boggling when I was 27 and I wrote my first song. It, I'd been so scared for so long um, and it went so well, uh, like the audience loved it. And then the next song and the audience loved it. And I was like, really? All I have to do is write this, the, all the stuff in my head and mm. people like it? Like that was just mind boggling, but it, and it's not for everyone. Not every single person in the audience is gonna love what's in my head, but, um, that doesn't matter. Just show up at the page. 
pour yourself out. And I, wanted so we, to add, yeah. I wanted to add something to this. Um, I was just going to say that I'm somebody who has always struggled with, you know, I'm very shy. You know, I might not speak up. I can be kind of lacking in confidence sometimes. And, um, uh, but when I'm a composer, I feel like I trust myself. And I know that when I feel something, I know it's right. Like I know, you know, there's that moment when you, you're, you're making a piece of it and suddenly it clicks and then you feel what the director wants to feel like you, the music has made it the thing. So, mm. so I feel like then that I have, I have to just sort of trust myself with that. And writing for Oslo was such a weird experience because you know, I, I live in Vermont. I live, you know, here with my son and I work in this little room, which is not ideal. And, um, during this time I was, you know, home with him and, um, it was a very strange experience to have like wondering, am I doing the right thing as a mom? Like I'm composing and I should be looking after him and there's a pandemic raging outside and blah, blah, blah. And um, I had to like look in the mirror every day and I actually had a little thing, some little, <laughs> I did that thing of taping things on the mirror of like, you are a great composer. <laughs> you <know? laughs> you're a great mom and you're a great composer. Um, and just sort of like, and working on the project was, it gave me so much more confidence at just, just to be doing something that felt like it was not just, you know, trying to live through a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so it, it, it was just so surreal. I, I, I hope this is over soon and none of us have to, have to work in these conditions again, but there it's, it's like to everything about myself was called into question about parenting, about composing, oh, yeah. about it all. So you just got to trust yourself. And I, I think just that inner confidence I have about my composing really got me through. <laughs> Zoe, how old, is your, how old is your son now? Um, he just turned 11. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know what, what your experience is because I have a kid about the same age, but mm -hmm. it, it's like, it's so funny because now Benny's starting to get us, you know, for the first time he's starting to get, I mean, he's his, his own musicianship is really kicking mm -hmm. in in a way. And now he wants to help out in the studio. Oh, and, yeah. he, <laughs> and he's like, he's like getting what we do more and getting the accomplishment of it and stuff. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just so beautiful mm -hmm. and satisfying and, and, mm -hmm. and reaffirming mm -hmm. about all of that. You know, um, I have like a ton of things to say about everything that people have said, but I, I will say two of those things. One thing is, I remember when I was a kid and my mom was painting all the time and she always would close her door and lock it and i decided that when i became a parent that i would do my own thing but the door would always be open and as a result there are literally no doors in our house like anywhere i mean it's a little crazy making but that's another story i think if your door is open you're doing great you know and and i, I mean i i think that's the key but the other thing I wanted to say about uh, this young woman is uh, questions herself is Nora, my wife and I were just talking yesterday and I've never spoken about this publicly. There was a guy at Juilliard, a famous composer, or he thought he was famous at the time. His name was David Diamond. And he was considered one of the uh, like mid-century American symphonists. And when I went to Juilliard, it was Milton Babbitt, Vincent Persichetti, David Diamond, Elliot Carter, those guys that were all there. And I got rejected twice from Juilliard before I got admitted. And now, of course, I hold a doctorate from there, which I, you know, this is many years ago. Um, but Nora went there and she has two degrees from there. And this guy, David Diamond, 20 years apart, she's 20 years my junior, told us both the, the, the same thing, told us that neither of us should ever write a string quartet, that it was too precious a, um, you know, a form. And then yesterday, we we're just talking about this, at the dinner table. And now my self, my current self, I believe I have surpassed him as a composer in both my accomplishments and my, and my craft. Um, I'm more well-known than he ever was. And I would love to go back to him and say, no, you should never write a string quartet. And if <laughs> Beethoven or Bartok had ever encountered David Diamond, they might have said that to him. But having said that, that kind of feedback, especially for a young person, is simply the wrong thing to say in every way 
morally, musically, it's not helpful. It doesn't make people better. It doesn't make them work harder. So you have to, as much as this is a collaborative process, and of course you have to take notes, and of course you have to rewrite, and that's part of what makes what we do fun. And it challenges us to be better, but you cannot have people around you who say mean and bad things to you, period. Yeah. Just you don't. I don't care if you're starting out, if you're 100, if you're 40, you can't have them around you. It's bad. Laura, right. when, you, that, when you were told that, how, what was some of the ways where you emboldened yourself and protected yourself from, from hearing that? Like, I just kept going. And I remember calling my mother one day and saying, Mom, you know, because she always told me when I was a kid and said, oh, you're a great composer, you're a great composer. And when I was little and writing music and and I said, uh, Mom, I, you know, I don't, I don't think I am a great composer. And, and, you know, I was 18 or something. I was really young. And uh, she just said, just keep going. Mm. So, and, and it's the same thing that Kristen said about, about the Stephen Sondheim thing. And I just had the pleasure of working with James Lapine, by the way, which was really fun. But, um, but it's just, you just, you just keep going one foot. And I just, I mean, at this, that point, I didn't know how to do anything else anyway. You know, it's like, what am I going to do ski? I mean, you know, I've just <laughs> I've been doing music my whole life and that was that, but I, I really, I, I really hate as an educator to see that kind of malarkey go on um, because it's just unproductive. And as, as a teacher, you know, you need to find your way to the students and what they're trying to say. And that that's what, 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 what good teaching is. And what he was is a bad teacher and now an unforgot and now a forgotten composer. So, um, you know, good. Yeah. I think, I think there is, um, something going on in our industry. I know it's going on in Broadway right now mm -hmm. where we're having very hard conversations about how to make sure we have a space that's mm -hmm. safe for every voice mm -hmm. yeah. um, and and starting to put accountability in place because that's, that's cool. part that's the hardest part is that you can find yourself you know in the middle of a great opportunity that's bigger than yourself. And, and forced to work with mean people and mm -hmm. and get into a place where where they're messing with your head every day and and mm -hmm. and starting to chip away at your uh, uh, confidence and um, one at that point recognize it mm -hmm. and learn to step out learn to like I remember having friends finding people that I could. I could say like, I'm in a real toxic situation. I've got to get through it. Um, what, where's my support going to come from? And how am I going to tr be someone that I am not to survive this, which you sort of have to do. But I think now we are really looking at um, making sure that's not allowed to happen in right. the industry, that there is accountability, that there is education around what makes somebody feel like they don't belong. Yeah. Um, I think at, at every one of us on this panel has been the only woman in the room at some point. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, know how to, there are rooms that are so great. And then there are rooms that, are, that you're like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm being interrupted every second and, and I'm not being respected and I'm going to have to either work mm -hmm. really hard to change it or survive it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think I've done both in <laughs> different situations, yeah, I but I, all, I'm, ex yeah. I'm excited about the conversation that's happening where that's not allowed anymore. Yeah. And also in, in saying that, I wanted to just add that part of the mindset is to remove the comparison thing where you mm -hmm. compare yourself to your peers or to people that you're looking up to or looking down, just, you know, it's your narrative. It's your journey. And also realizing that everyone who's a part of this team is flawed, that mm. there's, no, there's no one's perfect. No one has this clean character mm. of, of, you know, well, I, I, I need to defer to them. Yeah, if someone is, if it's their project and they're directing or producing it, obviously they, they do have an upper hand on what the direction is, but you're there because you have, you're of value. You have something to share and also you're learning. So you, 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 make it, you make it about you, maybe not in the sense of 
being this subordinate, but making it about you being up on this journey with what you're sharing. And that's what I really find is a muscle that I begin to strengthen is that it's, I stopped comparing myself. I stopped looking at, I stopped thinking about strategy. Like, well, if I do this with this person or this team, this, it's not, life is not, it's not strategic and we're socialized to have this concept of strategy and linearism and life is very organic and it's, it's, it, it unfolds. It really does. I used to hate hearing the one foot in front of the other and life's a journey. I was like, eh, I won't say what I want to <laughs> say because we're being recorded, but like, I want my destination. But now as I become more appreciative of the unfolding of things, it really is, it really is that. And you're being so, and, and you're being appreciated too, Catherine. Well, you know, you're being appreciated in a way and recognized in a way that you so deserve and have deserved yes. for so long. Absolutely. And I think I, I think wow. that's part of this whole conversation too, Kristen. It's like um, Thank you. you know what we do to change the conversation, how we can um, you know, have a more positive environment, how how we can eliminate toxic uh, places and how we can provide opportunity for ourselves and each other and where our talents are now being fully appreciated in the way that they should have always been and will always be going forward. Yeah. And well, Zoe, please, I'd love to wrap this up. Sorry. I'd love to hear your what you were going to say before. Oh. Oh, just, I just all, all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to I was going to say how how important it I've I've learned that another there's so much about all this is true and and um having other people to talk to like the you know peers or just other women who are also working in music or you know to talk with them about like what's it like for you what's this project yeah. like to just you know that helps so much because i mean composers are often alone in a room <laughs> and it's hard to know what's going on and um you know just being able to um you know talk to other other people and see like what's happening for you what's your project like you know what's the working environment what are your days like you know yeah, that that is so, so valuable important. so Chris, Kristen <laughs> well I just wanted to say what I love about what Catherine said is, is actually the some of the advice I got in in this certain in this particular situation where I you know I don't know about the rest of you but so much of me was raised to be thinking about other people and, and thinking about the dynamics of the group. And when you're in a room full of people, I'm not gonna say all males are, are raised this way, but a, a lot of males are traditionally raised in a different way. It's not about relative, it's about achievement and parallel. And um, learning to recognize like, oh, I, 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 this is not about me making sure everybody gels or it, this is, I have to leave that part home and mm -hmm. I have to show up as the expert that they need me to do, mm -hmm. or, you know, for, for the job and the, with the experience yeah. of what, and that was a, a different way of thinking um, that also was very freeing. Like Catherine said, then everything can unfold as it needs to unfold. You deserve to be there with your experience and your, your wisdom and your, what you have to bring to the table. And you don't um, need to worry that everybody is best friends. Yeah. It's not, it's not book club. Right. Um, <laughs> no, I think that's, that's, a, that's sure. a great point. And I think it's, it's a, it definitely a, a change of, of approach that a lot of us have to consider when we walk into the room. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. I, I really appreciate, you're all nominated for an Emmy. You're all composers that we look up to. And I really appreciate your candor on these subjects. Um, it's just, it's so helpful for the community that you, you are all so willing to speak um, so openly about all this. Uh, we do want everyone to listen to your scores and vote. It's such an important part of this process. So um, as we're coming to the end of this, I would love for all of you to speak to kind of one of your favorite musical experiences, like the highlight, highlights on, on these projects you are on. And Laura, I'm secretly hope, hoping that you talk about the opera, but really you can talk about whatever you want. Um, <laughs> but uh, it'd be great to hear about one thing that when you listen to the score, you know, you have that great like flashback moment where it was such a positive moment for you. And, and, and Zoe, how about you get us started? Well, um, our score is really varied. You know, we have just cello and his piano and then it, there's an orchestra and a quartet, you know, it really, it travels depending on, you know, it sort of gets thicker and thicker and more intense and then thinner. But I think my favorite musical thing is 
that piece that we made before we had picture. Because I'm such a writing the picture composer. Like I like to, I like to improvise to the thing, you know, like I like to like work with the thing. I like to feel what the film is feeling, you know. And with that, we really kind of just imagined it in our heads. And I'd never really, and what was funny is that it ended up in the final version exactly like that, including the scratch tracks that I recorded on the cello. And, you know, we, ha we had a, a different pianist do the piano parts, um, you know, in a proper studio and then put it all together. But it still has that spare, fragile, like it might collapse, just like the Oslo piece of chord that it's about. Um, and, um, and I have to say, like, you know, I think it's good when your own work gives you chills. And when I hear the theme one, I guess it's called, and it, it happens multiple times in the movie, I get chills when I hear it. And, and, and so, and I'm not ashamed to say it. So I think that that's my favorite moment. <laughs> that's so cool. I love it. Laura. Well, I don't know if I would say it was fa my favorite moment because it was a very painful moment, but it, it being able to write a piece of opera to be broadcast on television was um, was pretty amazing, and and I'll I'll give you a little little bit of background. Uh, some of which I've talked about, some of which I haven't. Um, in Lovecraft, for those of you who've seen it, it, there is a there was a licensed piece of of a poem by Sonia Sanchez with her reading it, and I've long been a fan of her. She's a, a brilliant brilliant poet, and I and I since this has become a friend, which I'm so honored to say. Um, and I thought, well, what if we were to take her words and set them again so you hear them twice because they're that important. Catch the fire um, during the last scene and going into the end credits. And um, basically, it, I wrote this during in June of 2020, so everybody knows what was going on in the country, and um, it was over a scene of Tulsa burning. Um, and there was a piece of music. I don't know. I'm thinking so much about when I was a, a student lately, but I guess I am. There was a piece of music I was obsessed with, and it was uh, called Knoxville Summer of 1915. It was written by Samuel Barber. And it was a poem by James Agee. And I listened to that piece over and over again with Leon, Leontine Price singing it. And um, I love it, but it was a incorrect version of Knoxville summer of 1915. It was a romanticized and, and inappropriate version of what was going on. And I thought, maybe I have a chance to fix this by using Sonia Sanchez's words and Janai Brugger's voice and by, by doing this over, the, over these images that were of, of Tulsa burning, but, but Journey walking through with a ring of protection. She's protected by her ancestors and by magic, which she now has access to. Um, and so it was a very, um, it was a privilege to be able to do that and an honor and very touching and, and the outpouring of, um, of reactions to that piece from every imaginable kind of person, from the opera world, from pop stars, from fans of the show, from people feeling that that moment had the dignity that it so deserved was very, very creatively satisfying. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Catherine? Um, you know, I. I don't have a favorite moment because the entire process was just pure reverie for me. I mean, I just to be able to play the piano, a lot of times the piano is often not um, the prominent instrument in a score um, for a variety of reasons. You know, sometimes directors think it's too, too melodic or it might be, they want something more ambient. Anyway, the whole process for me, um, was just remarkable. I'm, I'm still, I, I really don't have the proper words because the way it all came together, like I, I almost didn't do the score. I was very, very busy. And um, I didn't know if I was gonna be available. And they literally, they waited for me. They waited for me to give them uh, the answer. And I mean, who does that? I'm just a composer, <laughs> who does that? And. <laughs> And so it wasn't even about they waited for me. I'm not talking about it from a place of bravado. I'm talking about the intention mm. of maintaining the synergy 
that we had had on the prior project and that we, again, that word reverence. And so for, for me, just kind of marinating in that and, and being able to play and, and be with people, the production uh, and the, the, the film company, KPJR, Karen Pritzker, Cassandra Jabala, who was the producer who reached out to me initially. I mean, uh, Jeff Boyette, and of course, the late, great James Redford. I just, I mean, it's an honor. It's an honor. So there's, I can't isolate honor. I can't isolate reverence. It's, you show up, you appreciate that, and that's what you have. And that's my spiel. Awesome. Thank you. And Kristen. Um, I, 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 they have the private one and then I have the public one because uh, the private one is that getting to write songs like this with my husband was just so fun. It, it's what we would have done on vacation for fun. So uh, getting to sing the 80s, like cracking the 80s song um, with all of that like family ties, silver spoons, punky Brewster theme song energy, and then singing like we got love. <laughs> we got love. Like doing that together um, was so fun. And, and really that's why I do what I do is, is that it's just play. My husband and I get to play like kids every day of our lives and that's really fun. And then the public one, I would say the internet is a horrible, horrible thing. But one thing it was really amazing for is the way that the Marvel fans interacted with the music. So a, a show would come out on Friday at like two in the morning. By the time we woke up in the middle of a pandemic, isolated up here in the woods of Connecticut, by the time I woke up, especially as the show grew momentum, I would get over a hundred different TikToks of people interacting with their creativity oh. with our work. Mm -hmm. So by the time Agatha All Along came up, um, and there, there, it was trending and it, and Catherine Hahn got to number one on the billboards, like the next day. Um, it was so much fun to see the amount of creativity that was happening. Cause they weren't just doing the song. They were adding in their own take. Um, and it made me feel less alone in, in like the height of the dark days. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was, that was really amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. And uh, I encourage everyone here and, and thanks so much for the attendees for coming and, and interacting. It's been great seeing your comments and your questions. And I'm sorry, I couldn't get to all of them. Um, and I encourage you to listen to everyone's music. Of course, uh, this is an Emmy panel and, and Emmys are voted on by Emmy members. And so a, a lot of our attendees, you know, I, and then Laura, you may be able to quickly speak to this, but you know, I, I know these are awards, but it's so important for you all if you are eligible to become a member of the, the different academies so you can become a supporting voting member and, and be an active part of your community. And, and Laura, can you speak to that just really quickly? Yeah, I mean, Catherine, you know, um, one of the goals of the AWFC when I was president was to really diversify the voting um, blocks in, in these organizations because we weren't getting awards and we weren't being considered and we weren't getting nominated. And I noticed something that Thomas said, the annual AWFC panel, that in itself is extraordinary because... Yeah. You know, in the olden days, I would be the only woman out of, you know, 30 if I got a nomination and, and it, you know, it, it, so we're, we are changing things, but um, changing it means that you've got to get active, you've got to get involved, you need to become members of, you know, the Motion Picture Academy, the Television Academy, the Recording Academy, it's not that hard to figure out you know, Catherine and other people at the AWFC will help you. And um, it is actually essential, actually essential for, um, for us moving this, uh, this big bear forward. Absolutely. So thank you again for your time, Zoe, Laura, Kristen, and Catherine. Thank you. It's been a thank pleasure you. for me to hang yeah. with you and so uh, look forward to spending more time with your music. And thank, thank you, you to the thank AWFC. You. Thank you. Bravo. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you all Bravo. of you. Uh, all right, cheers. Thank you, everyone.